Hello everyone and welcome to Underwater Adventures with Alex Mirabal. Today we will talk about how to date a wreck that you have found and for that I will tell you the story of a very interesting wreck we found in Cuba in 1991 that it has even funny twist in the end so I suggest you keep on watching till the end of the video and any question regarding the subject that you may have please leave it in the comment section and I will gladly answer or talk about that in another video so please let's dive into it The process of dating a wreck is one of the most important for everyone who is in this industry or it has the curiosity about shipwrecks and their histories. Every time that you find a wreck site, mainly when what is by chance when you are like swimming in an area which is potential for shipwrecks or diving in reefs and you come across a shipwreck, the first question almost everyone asks themselves is how old it is, when it went down, where it was coming from. So at least these first two questions will set if you are very excited about your finding or if it's just an unfortunate fisherman boat that went down three years earlier and will not give you a big load of historical information. So I will talk today about the many aspects that you want to have, you need to have into account when you try to set the date for a wreck or at least a time period which is short enough for you to understand which century are you dealing with and hopefully if you know exactly by the type of objects you find from which country was coming or going. So for that I will tell you the story of a very interesting ship, Nuestra Señora del Rosario, which was coming from Mexico on the way to Spain with a four stop in Havana, Cuba. So in the west side of Cuba, in the western coast in Pinar del Rio province, they normally sail over the north coast of Pinar del Rio till they arrive in Havana. They stop there for the winter months and then they continue to Spain with their cargoes. In that area, it was the English pirate Christopher Newport with his two little ships, the Little John and the John Evangelist, which was waiting for a ship that could fall behind from the Spanish fleet. So it could be an easier target. So he identified that the Nuestra Señora del Rosario, together with another ship, the Nuestra Señora de la Victoria, they were falling behind because they were sailing slower and he attacked them, he sunk them both. In the case of Nuestra Señora del Rosario was shallow enough so he could try to rescue the treasure, but the fleet was already coming back and the weather was not very good, so at the end he couldn't take the treasure off. When the Spanish fleet returned, they found out that the ship was under the water, cannons all a mess on top of the wreck, they couldn't rescue the treasure either. So 400 years later, that was 1590, 400 years later in 1989, 499 years later, <laughs> we set up with the small file from the archive, we received a small file from the archive in Sevilla, which says Nuestra Señora del Rosario, after having received some impacts under the waterline, she ran aground in the last key of the Sierra de los Organos in the way to Santo Antón Cape. That may seem little to go out to the sea in an expedition with 20 people on board and trying to locate that wreck. But it's not so, because the normal reference for a sinking ship or a ship that has sunk 300 years ago, 400 years ago, that you find in the archives is, for instance, it left Veracruz in Mexico, never made it to Havana. So that is a huge area. It's an area that you cannot control. But in our case, we had the reference to the last key of the organos in the weight of Cape of Santo Antão, a certain depth because she ran aground. You already have 
that is shallow because the draft of these ships was about six meters, so you must imply that the ship ran aground in six meters. So we set up, we went there for an expedition, really hoping that we will find Nuestra Señora del Rosario in a matter of days. It took longer. It took some months, a lot of blisters in your feet because of the fins. It took a lot of ear pain. And we actually located the wreck that... We located few wrecks. We found few wrecks in that expedition, but none of them look like a 1590 shipwreck. By no means. They were more recent, like probably 18th or 17th century, not, certainly not from the 16th century. And we almost by chance, I have to say, always the day that we were coming back to Havana for a rest after 20 days of expedition, we, the last afternoon we stopped in a place that is called Quebrado de Fuxa. Quebrado de Fuxa is like a break in the reef that is called Fuxa for a reason I don't know. But we stopped there to stay overnight, to rest, and continue the trip the next morning. What happened is that some of us went into the water to catch some fish to take home with us, and we came across this big ballast pile, which is an indication of a wreck site. In another episode, I will explain in detail what ballast stones are and why are they important to identify shipwrecks and their provenances. But we found this big ballast pile, a piece of an anchor, so a part of an anchor that was exposed that you could see on the seabed, the rest of the anchor was inside the ground, and we marked the place and said, oops, this could be a 16th century shipwreck, so let's go home, let's take a rest, and come back later. We came back 10 days later, we started trying to figure out this, if that could be our ship, because what normally happens in our expeditions, at least in Cuba, in Mozambique, in Indonesia, these are areas where you have plenty of shipwrecks. So you may go out trying to find one, but you come across other ones that you were not looking for. So you don't have information about them. So the normal and the most academic correct way is that you get your information from the archive, you analyze this information, and then you go to the sea and try to locate this shipwreck. What it happens very often is that you go out to the sea, you find another wreck that you were not looking for, so you have to start this detective story backwards and try to identify which ship it was. In this case, we have a little bit of both. First, because we were looking for Nuestra Señora del Rosario 1590, coming from Mexico, but now, later on, I will explain why is this important, in 1590. But we came across a ballast stone pile, an anchor, that could match the date of late 16th century, but still, you have to know. So, we started the works of excavating the wreck, and after removing some of the ballast stones, we found under the ballast stones two cannons. Cannons in wrecks are, in that time, this, every wreck has cannons, but cannons have, some of them, uh, iron cannons, but because bronze cannons are much more telling. Bronze cannons have a lot more information. They were more expensive pieces, so they were richly engraved and sometimes even have the name of the founder. There is a lot of information to take from bronze cannons. But the regular ones, which, is the, which are the iron cannons, they concrete very fast, they get oxidized and they get misshaped. So it's very difficult to try to find marks in the cannons that could tell you more or less the time in which they were founded. The iron cannons we found there, also by the type of cannon, these were very slender, slim and long cannons, they indicate that they were quite early, we are talking about, yeah, probably 16th century. And sometimes these cannons in the trunions, the trunions are these two side scenes that the cannons have to be put in the carriage so they can move in the carriage and aim better. In the trunions, sometimes they have dates. So it is a hard work to clean the concretion of the trunion to try to find some indication of year that they sometimes have, or sometimes have a letter which indicates the funding house or, or the country where they were 
cast it. So we cleaned the tuning on one of these cannons and the cannon had a date of 1567. Yeah, jeez, 1567, probably. Okay, it is quite some years before 1590, but that shouldn't be a problem for the dating. It still could be our wreck because cannons were used in ships for long years. And as cannons were not part of the ship, but a supply that the ship got every time that they went out to the sea, cannons moved from ship to ship, from trip to trip. So it was very common to find cannons in shipwrecks that they were made in different years. Uh, they were made in different places and they could be quite far away from the date of the sinking of the ship. But then we had our first clue. We have the cannons with the date that could match the date of the sinking. Oh, by the way, if you are sinking and going to the sea and start hammering cannons to find dates, please don't do. Please don't do. No, because I, I, I'm almost in your faces. Oh, that was a good tip. So I go now with my hammer and I hammer in the turning of cannon to see which year it is. Okay, it's not that simple. The, the objects that have been so long immersed in salt water, the iron objects or steel objects, they will grow together with the oxidization. They will grow a concretion that in a way protects them. They are in a chemical balance or equilibrium at the moment you find them after so many years. Any place where you clean that concretion off, this newly exposed area to oxygen water, the, the water has a lot of oxygen that it was not getting, it will oxidize that little part of the cannon more quickly than the rest of the piece. So what you found that was a beautiful cannon of the 16th century, if you do that, you may end up having a pile of dust in a few years and nobody wants that. That is a crime. So you don't do that unless you do it with a purpose and you are prepared to slow down the oxidization process, there needs of sacrifice anodes. There are zinc anodes that you can place in the piece to delay the progression of the oxidization. You will not stop it, but you will delay it. So if you are not really in the position that you can do all that and that you are doing it with the purpose of learning from the site, please don't do it. So please don't hammer cannons. <laughs> don't do that. It's just to tell you the story how you can get some of the data that you need to set a, a reasonable date range for the wreck. In this case, as I mentioned before, we already have our first clue. Cannons were made close enough to the date that the ship sank and before. So that gave us a first clue. This wreck could be the Nuestra Señora del Rosario we were looking for. So. We continue excavation. There are certain, there are, there are plenty of objects that you find in a wreck that don't have this quality of giving you reliable dates. Why? Because they were built during many years and many centuries, more or less in the same way. Olive jars, anchors, they change very little. So it is difficult to say, oh, this anchor is from the 16th century or this anchor is from the 17th century. It is hard and it's risky because you can get into the completely different century trying to find out and you are guessing from an object that cannot give you that information. But there are funny objects as well that they can give you information you were not looking for. For instance, we found in a wreck, which was a very rare find, in that wreck we found a turtle shell, a carapace, a turtle shell. And you one might think, well, what is strange in finding a turtle shell in the sea? Yeah, well, because it was a, a land turtle, it was not a sea turtle. So that was certainly transported in the ship, it was not swimming around. And, and why turtles would have been in the ship? Because these wooden ships at that time, they have these long trips and they always had a problem in how to store food because they don't have freezers, they don't have the cold that you need to keep meat and vegetables in a good condition. So they have to come up with ideas, you know, like salt and put everything in salt, but also eating salty meat and fish during six months, it can get you into trouble. Your crew will be very unhappy. So you also need to transport, they needed to transport live animals. And turtles are very good for that because they last forever. They eat very little. 
they almost don't drink water. And in this case, this turtle came out, it gave us a message which was, we were not looking for it, but it really came to add another little piece in the puzzle. Because this turtle, the, the geographical distribution of this turtle is central and a little bit of the north of South America. So our ship, the ship that we were looking for, was coming from Mexico and it makes total sense that the turtle could, could have been put in the ship in Mexico or in any other country of Central America and a little bit of north of South America. Sometimes finds like that could give you information that even if you were not looking for that information, it will help you out in identifying the shipwreck that you have found or just stumbled on it. Other curious find is the mercury. Mercury, the mercury we know from the thermometers, uh, mercury of nowadays it is used in plenty of stuff. It was used at the time in the refine of the silver to take the silver out of the mineral that came out of the mines. Some person, very intelligent one, came in 1554 with a process of cleaning that silver using mercury. It's called Proceso de Patio and it was established in 1554 in the mines in Mexico and Potosí. So when you find mercury in a ship, you could be almost sure that it's after 5054 because before 5054 there was no reason for them to transport large amounts of mercury. One thing which is very curious about mercury is that it's so heavy, that it's so dense and it's so toxic that it doesn't get concreted, it doesn't get anything on it. It looks like the small pools on the seabed, the small depressions or cracks which are filled with this liquid metal, they shine like a mirror and like if the mercury would have fall today on them. The waves don't move it from there, I mean maybe a hurricane or something, but they get together again in another hole and you have these beautiful, these beautiful pools of, I'm laughing because I will tell you a story now, these beautiful pools of mercury. It is easy Depending on the quantity, it's easy to recover. You can do it with a spoon in a flask or in any kind of recipients because it's so heavy that it will not go in the water, it will not dissolve, obviously. You can do it with a spoon or dropping things, the one that you use for the eyes, you take it and put it if there are small quantities. As I said, it was like a third hint in, or the third piece in the puzzle that, that this could actually be a wreck, the Nuestra Señora del Rosario. So, there was one guy, one, one diver, which was at the time was a rookie. I will not mention his name because today he's a renowned diver and he will not like me trashing him in public. <laughs> but but he, was, it was like his first expedition. And the guy came up, we have been recovering mercury for some days, and he came, up of, came out of the water very excited. I said, okay, give me this little drop thing. Pipette. Yeah, pipette. Okay, the drop pipette. Thanks, baby. And because I will, uh, I, there is some mercury down there. Obviously, nobody doubted because we have been recovering mercury for the last days. But then the diver who was working with him, he came out really, <laughs> really laughing. He was laughing because he said, you cannot, you cannot imagine what this guy is doing down there. He's trying to get the bubbles from the regulator that they go, if you, if you put your hand underneath a ledge or something, the bubbles stuck in the ceiling, in the roof of the cave or whatever you're working, and they stuck there and they look shiny as mercury. But I mean, nobody in their right mind will try to take mercury from the top and not from the bottom. So we told him, yeah, yeah, tell, tell the guy to come up. He said, no way, I, I'm letting him try, <laughs> trying to get bubbles in this pipette as long as he realized that that he's trying to collect air. But anyway, what I mentioned is, is uh, because mercury, as some of the other objects or materials that uh, archaeologists like to call chronodiagnostic attributes, which is a very long and boring thing, but it can tell you, it can give you information about the dates. The dates they were built, the day they were stop being built and it can give you already a feeling of the date of your wreck. So then after the mercury we came through obviously the coins. Coins are a preferred object for us to understand dates 
because most of them have the date inscribed. They just simply say, I was made in this year. Some of them don't, because coins in the new world, they start being stamped with the date quite late, not in the very beginning of the 15th century, and not all in all mint houses. So it, it, it is not that easy that it will have always the date, but they will have at least the stamp of the assayer, the guy who was the responsible for the mint house between this and this year. And that we know from the records, that Sebastián de Ocampos was the mint assayer in Mexico from 1610. Well, okay, so you, you, you are already, you have a range of years, a small range of years, smaller than the life of a person, in which you can already place your sinking date nearby. Because you said, okay, it could again travel with old coins, like old cannons, but it could not be that old, so you are closing the gap. In the case of this wreck, we found about 13,000 silver coins, most of them from Mexico, so minted in Mexico. As we knew that Nuestra Señora del Rosario was coming from Veracruz in Mexico, well, all these things made sense. The coins, the majority of the coins were minted in Mexico. The turtle shell was turtle that live in that area as well. So everything was coming together. There is also another issue with the possible identity of the ship. Is that as we knew that she was coming from Veracruz in Mexico, normally the ships that depart from Veracruz, they were carrying the treasures that they were brought in the Manila Galleon. The Manila Galleon was coming from Manila in Philippines, collecting goods in, the, in Southeast Asia, and then will travel through the Pacific Ocean till Acapulco, on the Pacific side of Mexico. Then this cargo will put into mules and these mules will go through the entire country and download the treasures and the cargo into the ships that were in Veracruz and they were going to Spain. What happened now that during our excavations a friend of mine, Faure, he found a beautiful gold chain that after we went all totally crazy of how a beautiful find it was, then the specialists in jewelry, they found out that the chain was made in China, which for a ship coming from Mexico, if you don't know this connection to the Manila Galleon, it will be a little bit uh, puzzling. Not nowadays, but that everything is made in China, but back in the day, it would be very rare to have a ship that is coming from the new world with a Chinese object, but as we knew that she was coming from Veracruz and most probably were transporting some of the cargo of the Manila Galleon, so everything started falling into place and taking shape that yes, this could be our Nuestra Señora del Rosario. Then we came to the gold. Gold, as you may imagine, is like everyone's favorite object to find because first of all, it's valuable, Second is rare. Third is clean as the moment that it fell in the water. So even in the moment that you find it can give you a lot of information because most of the gold objects, they would have marks. They would have like ownership marks or the maker's mark that they will allow you to put this piece into a context. That is what really helps you in the research of how the ship, which ship it was and everything. So we had, as we were finding gold, and in every expedition you have this type of diver who is louder than the others and it suddenly becomes the protagonist of like every gold that was found, mine was bigger than yours and all these things. So we met, one day we found a large lead ingot of about 50 kilos of weight. So a massive piece of lead, which we swiftly painted into with a golden spray and put it into a place for the guy to go there and find it. So you, you must imagine his excitement when he found this uh, unheard of gold ingot of 50 kilos. And, and, well, he invited everyone for drinks and everything. We have a beautiful night until we told him that he has been recovering painted lead. But there is a better story about it. Before we found the first piece of gold, real gold in the wreck, we had, in the expedition, we had a visitor. 
a young man that was sent his father was at the time the representative of the U.S. office in Cuba and his kid was visiting and then they talk in the company and this young man, as he was about probably 20 or 21, he joined us in this expedition and he was just swimming around, enjoying the work we did and learning and it was a, it was a good company to have on board. And one afternoon he asked me for permission to go swimming with the snorkel, not even with bottles or anything because he was not a diver. But, but he said, no, I go snorkeling around the ship the, because it was too hot and he wanted to be in the water. So I said, yeah, sure. And then <laughs> I came back with two massive gold bars full of all the stamps and everything. So when he went up into the deck of the ship with these two gold bars, he was not even very excited because he said, ah, this must be a prank. So he came with the two gold bars and go to that diver and ask him, I found this. What do you think it is? I said, ah, that's painted lead. <laughs> they did that to me already. So he put, the, he put these two beautiful gold bars, I mean like unique artifacts. They put them on top of the air compressor that we used to fill the bottles. So I came back from my dive shift, I saw the gold bars there, and I thought the same. And they were trying to prank me, I mean, who, why is not a party on board? Why is not everyone jumping around? And everyone had the same feeling. So nobody got overexcited over these two bars. It was the first ones that we found in our company, in our country, in our lives. So it was the first gold bars ever for us. And, and like, like late in the afternoon when we were already like closing shop, we started wondering, hey, why nobody has already said, yeah, the prank is mine, ha ha ha. And then I asked the guy, could you show me where do you found the gold bars? Say, yeah, sure, it's really close to the boat. It's like about 20 meters away. It was sitting on top of a coral. But, but you can show me the spot. Yeah, absolutely, I can show you the spot. So we dove together with snorkel because it was very shallow. And he said, it's here, it's this coral. So in, even on top of the coral, it was like this brain coral that they are very round. On top of the coral, you could see the mark where the bar the gold bar was standing for centuries. And then I went down, fanned a little bit of sand, and there was full of gold and coins and everything. The guy had just discovered like what we call the second part of the treasure of that ship, just by swimming around. So that was a discretion, but it has nothing to do with dating, but it's an exciting gold story. And obviously the gold also had marks in which later on we found out that they were coming from the mines of Pachuca in Mexico and other one from Tasco. So yes, there, there, was, there, there was information from these gold bars that also fit into the picture that we were getting from the Nuestra Señora del Rosario, or what we thought it was Nuestra Señora del Rosario. Then, with the coins, with the silver coins, with the sheer amount of silver coins, about 13,000, the process of cleaning these coins is quite time-consuming. Normally, we use electrolysis, which uh, is, a, is an electrolytic bath in which you can put just a certain amount of coins, and it takes a while for the coins to reduce and to take the rust out and you can actually study them and see their characteristics because when they come out of the water, the silver coins, you cannot almost read anything. I mean, you have to be very lucky that the coin is fairly clean, but normally it takes a while for the lab or the conservation facility that you have to come out with the clean coins that you can actually study or catalog or classify. So this process was ongoing and we were keeping on excavating the wreck. Every find in the wreck, every artifact just add to this puzzle to put it together and say, yes, this is Nuestra Señora del Rosario. So everyone was very happy, documentaries were made, articles in the press were released, and almost when we were about to finish the excavation, I was called by the numismatic of the company and asked me, have you found a group of coins so we were in a different place on the wreck or the coins are all the same? I said, no, all coins come from the same place. I mean, there is a large area, but all the coins were mixed together. Why? So, well, because there is 10 silver coins out of 13,000 that they were dated 
dated in 1610. What that means for our research? I mean, you could say, yeah, well, they're close enough to the sinking date, but the problem is that they are after the sinking date. And a ship could be carrying coins, very old coins. They can carry very old cannons, but what a ship cannot carry is something that hasn't been built before the ship sank. So it couldn't have 10 coins out of 13,000 dated 10 years or 20 years later. It couldn't have one, as simple as that. And that, it crumbled the entire story of our, the identity of our ship. Every piece that we put together, it suddenly started not making sense because there were 10 little coins that they were 20 years later than the sinking of the ship. Yeah, of course, this still today, that was 1991 when we finished excavating that wreck. But even today we discuss because there have been chances, there are chances that these coins were contamination from another wreck that we have excavated in these days and they were still remaining in the expedition ship and they were mixed somehow with the coins from the wreck, many things. But that teach us that you have to be very careful in maritime archaeology research when you cannot be absolute about anything. Even if it's white and it comes in a bottle, it's not necessarily milk. So this is something that you have always to carry with your research. Well, that's all for today. Thank you very much for joining me in Underwater Adventures with Alex Mirabal. If you liked the video, please get into a comment section, give me a like, subscribe to the channel. And it is important, the comment section, because I will be checking the comments to see which content you want me to develop, because I want to tailor the content to your liking. Please do that. I will be checking. So see you next time.